It's a great honor for me to be here at the Empire Club of Canada today, which is arguably the most famous and historically relevant speakers podium to have ever existed in Canada. It has offered its podium to such international luminaries as Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, Audrey Hepburn, the Dalai Lama, Indira Gandhi, and closer to home, from Pierre Trudeau to Justin Trudeau. Literally generations of our great nation's leaders, alongside with those of the world's top international diplomats, heads of state, and business and thought leaders. It is a real honor and a distinct privilege to be invited to speak to the Empire Club of Canada, which has been welcoming international diplomats, leaders in business and in science and in politics. When they stand at that podium, they speak not only to the entire country, but they can speak to the entire world. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Empire Club of Canada, the country's go-to forum for conversations that matter for 120 years and counting. To formally begin this afternoon, I want to acknowledge that we're gathering today on the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the homelands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We encourage everyone to learn more about the traditional territory on which you work and live. This is an essential step to reconciliation, and each and every one of us has a role to play. June is National Indigenous History Month, a month dedicated to recognizing the immense contributions and diverse cultures that First Nations, Inuit and Métis people have made to our society, to honoring the progress that has been made towards reconciliation, and to acknowledge the work that remains to be done. Moving to today's program, please join me in welcoming Shelley Babin, President and CEO of Atura Power, Indra Bhutani, President and CEO of Alexicon Energy, Jennifer Eady, Senior Vice President, Operational Services and Business Development at Bruce Power, Heather Ferguson, Senior Vice President, Business Development and Corporate Affairs at OPG, and Leslie Gallinger, President and CEO of AISO, who will deliver special remarks. And the Honorable Lisa Wright, Vice Chair, Global Investment Banking, CIBC Capital Markets, who will masterfully moderate today's conversation. Welcome to the Empire Club. Our energy system is un undergoing extraordinary change, transitioning from fossil fuels to renewables and finding ways to balance our energy mix to ensure a future as clean as possible is one of the biggest challenges of our time. A generational endeavor that will put pressure on supply chains, the labor market, and that will test our ability to work together, to be agile, to mobilize capital and innovation. The energy transition is also a unique opportunity, a massive undertaking that will create jobs, business growth, and that will accelerate our competitiveness. You know, just think of how Ontario is leading the way in EV battery production, bringing jobs, innovation, and investments to the province, and positioning us to be world leaders in this space for decades to come. You know, we accept uh, questions from the audience for our speakers, uh, so those of you in the room, you can undertake to scan that QR code found on your program booklet, uh, or for those of you online, through that Q&A under the video player. If you require technical assistance for those online, please start a conversation with our team using the chat button on the right-hand side of your screen. The Empire Club is your forum for sharing ideas, lessons, and best practices. As a not-for-profit organization, we would like to recognize our sponsors who generously support the club and make these events possible and complimentary for our online viewers to attend. Thank you to our VIP reception sponsors, Bird Construction, BWXT Technologies, <laughs> and thank you to our supporting sponsors, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, and OEC, thank you. And uh, thank you to our in-kind sponsor, the Organization of Canadian Nuclear Industries. 
Lastly, thank you to our season sponsors, Amazon Web Services, AWS, Bruce Power, and Hydro One. I uh, would also like to take this opportunity to recognize the club's board of directors, staff, and all of you, the members of our incredible community. Thanks for being here today. And a uh, special mention to my dear friend Michael Kobzar on our board for your leadership. You know, none of this would be possible without uh, your commitment to making this a reality. I also uh, wanted to take pause to thank some of our younger colleagues, uh, the students and the young leaders in the room. Thanks for being here today. This is important and, uh, you know, so thank you all for being a part of our community and helping advance public dialogue on topics that matter. I uh, would now like to take this opportunity to invite Leslie Gallinger, the President and CEO of the Independent Electricity System Operator, AISO, to offer remarks. Leslie. Over. Thank you, Sal. Thank you very much for inviting me to provide context for today's conversation. We are delighted to have our new Associate Minister of Energy Intensive Industries, the Honourable Sam Oosterhoff, here with us today. Sam, thank you for joining us. And we're all looking forward to working with you. I certainly appreciate the Empire Club facilitating this important dialogue on the energy transition, which is a key to the economic and social well-being of everyone in Canada, with lasting impacts on the legacy we will leave for future generations. The great energy transition is transforming our communities, our economy, and our society. After decades of stable demand and energy surplus, Ontario's electricity system faces unprecedented growth. The IESO's latest forecasts predict that demand will increase at a rapid rate for the next 25 years in response to growing upward pressure to support more people, more homes, significant economic growth, and the electrification broadly of our economy. At the same time, we are working to decarbonize Ontario's electricity system, which means expanding our non-emitting fleet by building more nuclear, hydro, wind, and solar. To decarbonize the broader economy, though, is a much bigger undertaking. It requires transformation of entire sectors, like transportation, industry, and agriculture, and extends to the way we heat and cool our homes and other buildings. All of this equates to as much as a 60% more electricity being consumed by 2050 versus the amount that we're using today. And therein lies our challenge. We need to grow and decarbonize the grid simultaneously. During a period of significant change, all while balancing reliability, affordability, and sustainability. Based on the IESO's Pathways to Decarbonization report, upsizing the system to the extent needed is a monumental task. We will require a potential six fold increase in the existing workforce to build these projects. We will need land with siting requirements estimated to be 14 times the size of the City of Toronto. And most importantly, we'll need capital to build new resources and upgrade existing technologies. At the bulk system level alone, the IESO estimated the cost to be $400 billion. And what is critically important as we embark on this option, on this build out of our system, is the pace at which we do so in order to maintain reliability and affordability. We must stay ahead of demand 
building the system, anticipating economic growth, and seizing opportunities to maintain Ontario's clean energy advantage, and to position us as energy leaders long into the future. So that's the challenge and the opportunity of the great energy transition. Strengthening the system in an orderly and thoughtful manner to balance reliability, affordability, and sustainability in every step of the process as we capitalize on the significant economic opportunity that the energy transition presents. I'm pleased to say from the perspective of the system operator and planner, Ontario is in a strong position. Thanks to the hard work of our sector, which includes generators, transmitters, local distribution companies, municipalities, and Indigenous communities. And to my colleagues at the IESO that I'm privileged to work with every single day. Our collective efforts to prepare and to manage the transition are proving successful, demonstrated by the flurry of investments in our province. The strength and diversity of the current grid has proven to be both an enabler for and a catalyst for significant economic growth, evidenced by some $50 billion being invested in our province by Volkswagen, by Honda, Stellantis, and many more. The momentum of that investment will attract even more and serves as an important signal that our work to facilitate the great energy transition should continue. And that's why, as the entity at the heart of the sector, the IESO is doing its utmost to ensure an orderly transition. We are leading the sector during a period of unparalleled growth, the likes of which Ontario hasn't seen before. And we're focused on expanding Ontario's electricity system responsibly, at the right pace, in the right place, to meet the rapid growth and to make sure electricity is available where and when it's needed at a cost that is affordable. At the IESO, we recognize we cannot do this alone. It will take the shared contributions from everyone inside and outside of our sector. We need to work with our generators, we need to work with financial institutions, municipalities, indigenous communities, transmitters and distribution companies to find compromise, to share risk, and to find better solutions to build out our electricity system. That is why I am so pleased to have been invited here to introduce today's panel, who can provide their perspectives from their space in the system as leaders in our sector on how to enable the great energy transition. I'll start by introducing today's moderator, who probably needs no introduction. I'd like to introduce the Honorable Lisa Raitt. Vice Vice Chair of Global Investment Banking at CIBC Capital Markets. Lisa joined CIBC in January 2020 and currently focuses on senior client coverage, business development with clients, and in the energy infrastructure and industrial sectors. And prior to that, Lisa was President and CEO of the Toronto Port Authority, and in 2008, elected to the House of Commons, where she went on to hold three senior portfolios, serving as the Minister of Natural Resources, the Minister of Labor, and the Minister of Transportation. Lisa, thank you for joining us. I look forward to today's discussion, and I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna ask my uh, panel mates to come on up here. Uh, as you know from your, from your program, we have with us today Shelly Babin, the President and CEO of Atura Power. We have Indrani Bhutani, who is the President and CEO of Alexicon Energy. Jennifer Edzi, Senior Vice President of Operational Services and Business Development at Bruce Power. And Heather Ferguson, Senior Vice President of Business Development and Corporate Affairs, Ontario Power Generation. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Now, as you're settling in, I will state the obvious. This is not a mantle. <laughs> and just to put you in the right time frame, it's not International Women's Day. <laughs> it's not why we're here. We just happen to have the top leadership voices in Ontario on electrification here with us today. They all happen to be women, which is a pretty awesome thing. And because I know they're tough, we're going to start right away, and we're going to start with a tough question to Heather Ferguson. <laughs> I thought 
I picked the right seat at the end, and not, it was debatable whether I was even supposed to be here because I'm not on the picture, so I thought I'd get a, an easy run. You're on my picture. Oh, you are. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Heather, when you undertake a project at OPG, your timelines are super long. And I know from experience that government administrations don't last as long as the build-out of some of these projects because I started in natural resources with the hope of building a nuclear power plant and I finished without any hope at all. I'm wondering if you can bring us through how OPG thinks about these kinds of projects when you know that the decision makers may very well change halfway through your build. Whew. Okay. Uh, I mean, you're not wrong. The, the types of projects that OPG has traditionally undertaken, and I'm looking right over there. Do I sound weird? Okay, somebody gonna work on that? Okay, great. Um, I'm looking over there at Mike Martelli, uh, who used to run our projects organization. You're right, they take, they take a long time. A hydro project's gonna take about a decade, a nuclear project longer. You just better prepare for the fact that your, uh, whether it's uh, provincially or federally, that government is probably not going to be there at the end of it. When you start on a project, you also aren't starting from a baseline of nothing. I think your best way to kind of insulate yourself from those changes to think about the community in which you probably operate already. So OPG has got assets all across the province, their hydro assets, and certainly in, in Durham, we've got great relationships with the community. So how are you building those relationships with your municipal community? How are you building those relationships with the indigenous communities? Because when you start your project, you are not starting your relationship with them. You should be at a very, very good place with that. And those relationships are going to what's insulate you and help secure a quicker path forward. And particularly on the Indigenous side, I say it often like a broken record. Um, everyone should be thinking about how do you form those partnerships, those true partnerships. So whether that's an equity partnership or something, that, that true partnership with that community, because they will help carry you through some of those changes. So sticking to partnerships, Jennifer, Bruce Power has done an awful lot of work with municipalities, with local Indigenous groups, just to make sure that everyone's in lockstep in terms of what the plans are. Tell us a little bit about the importance of municipal working, working together with municipalities. Uh, well, it's, I mean, to echo what Heather said, it's, it's paramount. It's the communities that we live in, um, and so they have to be comfortable with our operations, and we see this on a, on a regular, ongoing basis. Every day we're looking at our local external um, communities, whether it be uh, municipalities or our indigenous communities as well. And, you know, to echo what Heather said, like when we look at our roadmap for the opportunity for new nuclear, yes, we have elections on there. It's, it's certainly on there, so we have visibility and consideration, but if you think about the, the duration, it takes more than a decade to build a nuclear plant, and um, the, the promising part um, for, for stable energy policy is that we know that the province needs a lot of power, and it, it, will, it doesn't matter what uh, parties what parties elected, the need for electricity is, uh, doesn't change, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see very strong, stable energy policy. Indrani, the, um, you're sitting amongst a lot of power generators here today, and you're the, you're the distribution person. Tell us a little bit about how you view um, distribution as part of the energy transition. It's such a wonderful question, and certainly as a sector, we have focused at the top line, if I can call it that, at generation first. And certainly we knew um, coming out of uh, the last few years, certainly over the last three years, there's been a full recognition as Leslie introduced our panel and with her opening remarks that uh, we are upside down on the amount of generation that we have and the amount of generation that we need. So it was the right place to focus. We also then focused on transmission. But as I say over and over again, if you can't get all of those electrons to homes and businesses, then it doesn't matter, it's all for naught. And so it's interesting because when you look at distribution, yes, we're the last mile, so that part is the foregone piece. We need to get the electrons to people, to their businesses. But the other part of it is when we consider how we got here, like why are we upside down on generation? Why do we need more power? We need more power because as we've talked about, it's the, this is the energy transition, the great transition. It's the energy transition panel. What's causing that? Well, the mitigant, uh, sorry, the catalyst is climate change. And generally speaking, when business talks about climate change, we talk about it as 
or you know, businesses in general, uh, the business sectors, talk, talk about it as the existential threat to humanity. The interesting thing when it comes to energy, and certainly when it comes to distribution, is that it's not an existential threat. It's the immediate threat to the way that we deliver electrons. And I say that because our distribution system has not been built to withstand the kind of storms, the kinds of changes that climate change is imposing on us. And we say that, and we understand that, we need to storm harden, et cetera, and we are transitioning, the, so the broader economy wants to transition away from carbon-based carbon fuels and therefore decarbonization, electrification, enter the conversation that we're having. But the last piece, and the piece that we don't talk about, um, is certainly distribution focused, and that's that um, climate change is having a very real threat, as we all know, on our natural environment. Okay, so Indrani, such a great light bulb, pun intended. No, it's a, the light bulb is in fact the vegetation is changing. When temperature changes, vegetation growth changes. When vegetation growth changes, how much you need to do to vegetation manage changes. How you manage your system changes. The investment you need to make changes. And so it's not just about a renewal of our distribution system, but it's a distribution system that is now fit for purpose. I think Leslie said six times as much energy as we have been using currently. Well, our system isn't built for that, and we can't get to that last mile. So the investment in the distribution system has a twofold impact. First, what it will do is get the electrons to people's homes and renew the distribution system so that it is fit for purpose to withstand the effects of climate change. But the other piece is make the investment in generation, make the investment in transmission. In distribution, it's untapped. We can provide electrons back. And that's the last piece to shore up the whole picture. We are an ecosystem. And so that is the piece where distribution fits in, not just the last mile, but a contributor overall. Okay. Um, for your part, um, for your part, Shelley, Adotor, it's not only uh, power generation. You're also doing some really neat things in battery. So tell us a little bit about that. And, and if I could, one of the things that you brought up in our pre-call was the importance of remembering about the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So if you can expand on that a little bit. Sure, yeah. Thanks, Lisa, for the question. And, and for those who don't know, Atura Power is uh, the largest natural gas power generator in the province. Um, we've also been, and we see ourselves as having a really critical role to play in the energy transition as gas producer. Um, but we also want to participate in diversifying and contributing to the energy transition in other ways. Um, and one of those ways is through battery energy storage. And so through the IESO uh, recent procurement, we were successful in picking up a battery energy storage project. So it will be a grid connected, 250 megawatt, uh, four hour battery. Uh, we're gonna site it next to one of our existing stations, which gives us the ability to leverage existing infrastructure um, a great relationship with our host community there already, um, relationships with Indigenous uh, First Nation or Indigenous Nations as well. Um, and we see the battery project as being able to complement the needs of the system. So gas still continues to be incredibly uh, useful and necessary to support reliability and affordability. The storage that's available today can provide the ability to shave off some of those peak needs for four hours at a time. So there's potentially more work to be done in advancing that technology, but this is a really great place to start. And so we are very excited uh, to be, we're gonna be breaking ground later this year on that project, have it in service by 2026 um, and be, be grid connected. Uh, we also have a hydrogen program um, which you know is, I think is an, another way that we're looking to diversify and understand how hydrogen can be an application uh, for use in supporting uh, the power sector as, as well as other sectors. Um, and yeah, on the supply chain, I think you know we heard we heard Leslie and Sal talk about the energy, the great energy transition. It's happening in Ontario. It's happening in Canada. It's also happening everywhere in the world. Um, and so we are, um, we have huge needs, but our needs are small compared to what's happening elsewhere. Um, and so when we look at our needs for uh, major equipment, whether it's for our gas projects or for our other projects, we are competing with Europe. We're competing with 
uh, you know, the Middle East, we're competing with the United States. Um, and so it has been challenging uh, because timelines are tight. And so we need to be creative and innovative. And I think this is something that the sector is finding uh, is necessary. We're looking to leverage relationships with our OEMs where we can. Um, I think there's a great amount of collaboration in the sector um, to leverage buying power. Uh, you know, we, we we need to plan and, and plan early and plan often, and, and sometimes that's hard when timelines are tight and things are moving quickly. Um, but I think it's, you know, really just about getting ahead of getting your slot in the queue so that you know that you're going to get the equipment onto your site uh, on time um, so that your projects can be put into service when, when the system needs them. The um, All levels of government, all orders of government are pegging their policy choices around three very similar, I would say, anchors. Reliability, affordability, and a variation on sustainable or clean, depending upon what government you're talking about. And the one that actually gets the attention the most, not that there's a particular order, but surely affordability, Heather, is a big, big question mark when it comes to motivating decision makers because of what they're hearing at the door. So can you tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about affordability? Because yesterday we heard from, um, we heard from Philip Dunsky, who was the chair of the Canadian Electrical Workshop, Electoral for Council. Council Workshop. You know what? Federal government has a lot of acronyms, but <laughs> it was a really great, impressive panel um, of advisors who came together to come up with a report that was actually issued on Wednesday, on Monday, and I know that there's a couple of members of that advisory group right now. But within that document, they said that they believe the total budget or the total investment that's going to be needed for electrification in Canada is $1.4 trillion with a T. There's only so many taxpayers and ratepayers in the country. How do we afford all this? Well, I'm not going to pretend to have the answer to this because if I did, it would, you know, I'd be in a different job. Um, but I'll, I'll sort of build off some themes or some ways of thinking about it. And Leslie referenced, you know, in Ontario, it's a $400 billion price tag. So, I mean, I think unquestionably electricity rates are, are, are going to increase. But it's, it's something to do with the pace at which you, you move things. So you need to be planning the system out and moving at a, at a decent clip because if you move slow, that only is going to cost more. So there's got to be the right pace, but it needs to be efficient. Um, Shelley raised a point, and I mean, this is one of the things that's going to definitely be able to keep our, our rates in check and our reliability there um, is, is making sure we have enough gas for the timeline that we need it for. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but there is going to need to be a fair bit of flexibility around this 2035 timeline. So you really, really need to keep the gas in there. And we've done modeling. I'm sure everyone in this room has done modeling that shows what happens when you take that gas out. The rates go through the roof. You need to excessively overbuild your renewables, your battery storage. You probably don't have enough land mass to do that. And you don't have a reliable grid. Um, that can electrify all the other sectors that are the heavier emitting, so you don't get your climate change goals, and you're sort of haven't really advanced things. So that's sort of how we need to think about it. So what does that come back to? And, and you know, maybe I'll let Shelley in a second talk about you know the importance of gas and how she's thinking about that for her fleet. Um, but there's other things that are going to happen too here. So. You know, as things electrify, you're going to be adding more and more customers. So yeah, there's big, heavy fixed costs associated with the, the electricity system. Um, the more you can spread that out across customers and have a very measured pace for electrifying, that helps diminish things, um, numerator, denominator type of an equation. And then um, just thinking about your total energy costs over time. I mean, yeah, our electricity bills are going to go up, but what is the total energy bill going to, what parts of it are going to come down? And, and I don't, I haven't seen the magic equation that shows how that all levels out, but those are maybe some of the ways we as a sector need to think about it. And Shelley, I don't know if you have more on the CER, the gas, the value of gas. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing about gas generation is that there is no like-for-like -like replacement of that technology in the system today. So even if we did all the things that Heather is talking about, so if we do this massive overbuild, and I think... The ISO numbers from a couple years ago are we need to double the existing wind, 175% increase in solar. We need firm year-round imports from Quebec that are significant. We need three times the amount of storage. Um, and you still don't have a fully reliable system even if you do that uh, because you simply don't have that flexible, stable, um, reliable generation that the system needs. Um, and so huge costs associated with that 
a lot of land associated with that, and you're left with a system that simply may not be able to attract the economic development, may not be able to support the electrification that the system needs to provide economy-wide emission reductions that we know need to happen through electrification if you don't have that reliable power. So yes, we see gas as being a, a needed uh, fuel in the system um, for a period of time. Um, that, that is transitionary, hopefully. Um, but I think the other thing is, not only do we need the existing gas in the system, but we also need more gas, and that's part of what the ISO recent procurement has done, is to add some incremental gas into the system to really shore up that reliability. While all these other things happen, we're gonna refurbish nuclear, we're gonna investigate large new nuclear, SMRs, you know, hydro development, all of these things, and gas really needs to be there to sort of be that, that supporting yeah baseline for those peaking needs that we're going to have. Indrani or Jennifer, yeah, on affordability. Um, I think we also need to look at the overall economic impact that this is going to have. And that, that, gives, that gives the province different levers to keep the price low for the consumer. So if you look at the refurbishment of the nuclear plants between um, OPG and Bruce Power over uh, the period of a decade, that's dozens of billions of dollars and more than 90% of it went into the Ontario economy. And so that gives government more levers for keeping the price down. Yeah. Indrani, any, any comments on affordability? Well, the challenge is that not only are we the last mile, but we are also the ones who send out the bill. <laughs> so <laughs> the buck ends up stopping literally with us. Um, I appreciate my peers so much, and yet the alphabet soup of energy still stops with who is your bill provider. And so I think that I, there's a due recognition in the sector that we need for this to be affordable and we need for it to be paced, but we also need to be our own marketers. I, we, um, we're talking amongst ourselves and we are not talking to the populace. We aren't talking to the people that are voting. We aren't talking to our rate payers. Taxpayers and rate payers, voters end up being the same humans. And so on affordability, we need to help people understand what this is going to mean for their lifestyle. So if I pick up on one of Heather's remarks, um, it's going to cost a lot of money. How big is the gajillions of money? I don't even know how many zeros are behind gajillions. I made up that word, but it's a big number. That being said, if, if we tell people and help them understand what it means for their life, that is part of the outcome. That is part of getting social permission on the bill. And it's, as, as Heather said, this, isn't, this is no longer about your electricity bill is this, your natural gas bill is this, your fuel for your vehicle is this, your energy bill has gone down and it's now whatever. And so affordability to me is not only about we have so many things to spend on and we have to make the investments, we have to pace the investments. We simply can't do it all at once in any event. But we also need to create the dialogue that is happening more broadly outside of the sector so that we get the social permission, so that governments don't shy away from, yes, the bill is going up, but we're good with it because here's what it means for you Ontarians. And so affordability, while a major issue, I too do not have that magic pill that says, Here's how we'll solve it. But a paced outcome as well as knowledge sharing so that people understand the why will get us far further. And I've said it previously, people would never have thought about the hundreds of dollars they now pay a month on a cell phone bill 10 years ago. But you show them value and you show them the meaning in their life and that's where you get the social permission because you've created a lifestyle shift. We need to create the lifestyle shift. But we still complain about our cell phone bills. And yet we still pay it. I know. And, st and go in for more. Yeah. And then call our providers and sit on the phone for an hour and a half. And while we gripe about it, we still pay the bills and we still have those providers. Yeah, indeed. Uh, but do governments have a role to play here in terms of affordability? Not about, not about sending a check to the end user, but in terms of maybe mitigating the cost on the investment side, do you think that the governments are doing enough in, in the space that they're in? Anyone? Well, I think it's fair to say, um, you know, at the federal level, we have seen some 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 stepping up there, which has been helpful, um, both in terms of the investment side of things. So whether it's the ITCs or CIB, CGF, we've seen that. Um, what we need to see is that brought to conclusion. Some things are still very much in the midst um, on the ITC front, in particular, 
Um, and then also, I mean, the other part of the affordability isn't just the dollars in, but it's how quickly you can actually execute your processes. And some commitments have been made around the regulatory processes, regulatory efficiency, Impact Assessment Act, getting that down to a manageable time frame will be so critical for the nuclear sector in particular. Um, so how are we going to do that is sort of, so we're, we're, we're part way there, they've stepped up, but we need to, we need to get that over the finish line. And industry needs to step up to, to show how we can do that. And Jennifer, um, Bruce Power actually has a partnership with, or has been funded by the federal government to do a partnership with CNSC to try to figure out how to streamline this kind of, this kind of process bogged down. Yeah, so um, I, I would say, uh, from a, a, a new nuclear perspective on the impact assessment, we're, we're first um, we're first out of the gate working with the IAC on this, and I you know there's a lot of commitment from the federal government, uh, both financial commitment from Enercan and also through um, uh, the commitment to streamline the Impact Assessment Act. Um, and I think we'll, we'll see we'll see how how that works. And there's a, a but it it is definitely very challenging because there's a lot of requirements to get there. So you know there's a commitment to say how can you do it in three years. But if you sort of walk through the process, there's a, there's an awful lot that has to has to change for that to even be possible. Um, and then when you look at things like ITC again, ITC is again very very. Um, progressive for us. However, there's a 10 year duration on them. And if you look at the sort of 10 to 15 years that it takes to build a nuclear plant, then those ITCs expire and don't, don't become that useful. So. Andrea? I would say that um, it's interesting that there's so much money available and yet so hard to access, mm -hmm. at least for distribution. And obviously I come to this, I, I applaud my peers in nuclear that have had access to uh, a chunk of the dollars. I'm excited at um, the prospects that our provincial government has set out with the Ontario Infrastructure Bank. I mean, that work is still under development, but there is a recognition that more money needs to flow into the system, more money needs to flow in in Ontario, and certainly the OIB was set up uh, for exactly that purpose, or at least that's amongst one of the purposes for which it was set up. Uh, so I'm excited at the prospect of being able to access that funding because it's clear that this can't be on the back of rate payers. We're not making investments that are tweaking along the fringe anymore. These are massive investments and therefore the dollars that need to be put into the system are significant. That being said, we have a, the government has other mechanisms that it currently uses that make uh, the electricity bill more affordable. When we consider a holistic approach to what people's energy costs are going to be uh, in totality, there's an opportunity to take uh, some of the subsidy, uh, prospectively, to take some of that subsidy and revisit it. Seven, seven billion dollars now is invested in the electricity system every year, uh, which is uh, great fortitude by our government in terms of helping Ontarians with affordability. But I look, uh, we are very proud to have been working with Minister Smith over these past several years. We look forward to working with Minister Lecce as well as the Assistant Minister Associate Minister, excuse me, as uh, Leslie referenced, in looking at these other opportunities, because there are some, it's just a question of how do you access them and when, and frankly, how quickly. Yeah. How about you, Shelley? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll speak to it from the perspective of the hydrogen sector, and that's one of the, the aspects of the sector that Atura is really committed to and, and hoping to be able to unlock. And one of the real keys to that is going to be through these federal incentives, and they're, they're there, they're out there, they exist. But as Heather said, it's sort of getting them to the finish line in a way that is understandable to the sector that allows capital to come in in a meaningful way. Um, and, and there are other policies and incentives out there as well that are really gonna support this because hydrogen will offer decarbonization opportunities beyond just the electricity sector, but it really is going to take electricity in order for us to get there. Um, through hydrogen production. And so I think that's an area where we need to see, you know, federal incentives and policies really coming together in a way that's going to allow us to move it forward more quickly. So in the great transition, not only do we have to have the investment dollars to do the building, we kind of have to have the people to build these things too. So who wants to chime in on what a great situation we're in right now in terms of having skilled labor and ability to do the building? I can start on the. I'll, why don't I start on the positive side? Because I think there are a lot of. There's obviously a lot of future challenges, but I think on the 
on the positive side through the work that's happening right now through the nuclear refurbishment as we've um, established strong supply chains in Ontario, we've established a skilled workforce, strong knowledge base. So from that perspective, we're in a pretty good position to start looking at new generation. Yeah, I mean, uh, the same, same sort of idea. I think um, we're doing a good job at looking at the future of that. So secure the supply chains, a, a good path on many of the technologies. Lots of work being done with um, the colleges, universities, skilled trades. Um, also starting much younger, building the pipeline, STEM careers uh, for youth and, and getting people attracted to all that. I think all of that is going. It's a little worrisome what are we going to do between now and then. So, I mean, we're doing great on the refurbishments right now. We're doing great with what we kind of have now. But in the next five years, ten years, this is going to grow exponentially. And we're not quite there with the colleges and the universities or the younger. So then you sort of say, well, where is your untapped labor market? Where can you find these people that you've not been able to attract? Because um, you're going to need them sooner than, than you might be able to produce them. And so that's where you got to look at untapped markets for. I, I don't know, like the indigenous population is the fastest growing population. So how can you attract more of them into the sector? What are we doing that's not attracting people to the sector that are ready to work and able to work now? I don't know, have certain portions of the, the, the female population checked out for various reasons? Are there folks that have left the sector that we can reattract? I don't have the answers, but these are the sort of creative things we're going to need to probably think about in, in you know, in sort of the five to seven year time frame, and then, and then beyond that, build it out with the with the programs. And, and I would say we're we're we work on it very hard every single day, mm -hmm. and on a small scale, like even if you think about the collaboration that we have in planning out all of these re refurbishments between OPG Bruce Power and and the ISO. Um, the sequencing is going to be so important because we all can't build at the same time between transmission and generation. There just isn't enough workforce. So that has to all be f factored into the planning and, and sequencing of, of how we're going to build this out. I don't think it's negative. I don't think, I don't, I, I'm on. I don't think, I, actually I could shout enough so people could hear me, but I don't think it's negative to recognize that we have a big challenge ahead of us in terms of, in terms of skilled labor. Indrani, you were going to mention something. I was going to say that um, it's interesting because several years ago, I would speak about energy, or I spoke about energy to my daughter, who was my daughter's class, who was, she was, I think, 11 at the time. She's 17 now. Recently, I spoke to my son's class, same grade level, and where my daughter's class was like, snore, who is this woman? Thank God she brought swag. My son's <laughs> class was peppered me with questions, was interested, still thankful for the swag, but uh, was absolutely dialed in to the energy transition, what electrification means, what it's going to mean for them. And so I think part of it is, yes, tapping into existing uh, sources of labor. I do think that we have to go as young as we possibly can. I really hope that your baby can hear us. <laughs> Thank you for growing another human. Other people, if you'd like to join in, uh, kidding. But we need, um, we need as many people to understand what the sector means. And the difference between, and this is where I think, uh, and I say this over and over again, at least in distribution, because we're terrible marketers, but we really do need to sell the sector. Sell it in terms of this is a job or a career for the next 30 years. There is stability in your career, but there's also diversity yeah. in your career because there will be so many things that we need to do, and they're not the same thing over the next 30 years. Like, this is not an end date of 2035. This is a, we talk about 2050, this is going, going to go well beyond 2050. So I think in terms of what should we be doing, we should be marketing, we should be selling the diversity of the jobs or the roles, we should be selling the opportunity to grow as we grow and change. And not dissimilar from technology roles where we say, you know, we don't know exactly what you're going to be doing in five years or 10 years. Or if we tell you, yeah, it's a job in AI, we can tell you you have a job in AI today, but we don't know what that looks like. Why aren't we saying that? I know what your job looks like today and maybe for the next three years. But do I know what your job looks like for the next five years? Here's your opportunity to help define your job because you're helping define our sector and you're helping our sector grow. And I think the last piece is we see this great transition out of other skilled workforces like healthcare. Mm. Why aren't we picking up those folks? They're smart people. 
They're committed. They're educated. We just need to help manage just. <laughs> it's easy for me to say sitting up here. We need to help manage that transition. So I think the indigenous partnerships, tapping into communities that we wouldn't have normally tapped into or traditionally tapped into, as well as the other items that I've yeah. cited. And as a CEO, Shelley, is this something you think about? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think, I, I, Indira, I like the way that you're positioning it because this is such an exciting time to be in the sector. We have an incredibly enthusiastic workforce who are great ambassadors for that sort of external facing hiring, but also retaining the really incredibly smart people that we have. Um, and we are really, we are creative and innovative in the way that we are attacking these problems of the day. Um, and it is a lot of fun. And so I think it, it just creates a lot of excitement and energy around what we're doing. And it, yes, it is about skilled trades and about overlapping complex work programs. Scott and I were talking over lunch about it. It is also about project managers. It's about engineers. It's going to be about just about everybody that you can think of um, is going to be needed to help us get where we need to go. So yeah, I think it's it, we gotta we have to really run with this momentum that we are building um, and, and the excitement that people outside of the sector are starting to have for what we're doing. Okay, two last topics kind of on the same theme. First one is something you said, Indrani, which is AI. Mm -hmm. Who wants to tell us about the good stuff coming with AI and how we're gonna use it in the great transition slash electrification? Well, I'll, I'll start and then I can stop talking after I tell you about the very little I know. It's. <laughs> So AI, so you know, data centers or big AI. I, I mean, I think this is something that the province and the ISO are probably considering. What, like, what does that mean to the electricity system? What does that look like? These massive loads, um, citing themselves. You know, what, what, you know, how do you manage that? And and maybe there's opportunities. They, you know, can provide some flexibility. Maybe they're a good way to help manage load. I don't don't know for sure. But not all AI, I, I think, is created equal. Um, I think there's some AI opportunities, data centers, opportunities with tech companies where you can um, draw in broader economic development and growth. So, you know, you're citing a, a data center, you're, you know, what does that mean? Um, is there going to be adjacent uh, co-locating of academic institutions, training? And it can be part of a, a, you know, a little hub, a little AI hub, and that could have great value um, to, to the municipality, to the province, and could be something that we're building out in addition to just being a part of the, you know, the system drain. But then there are others that aren't like that, and so it, it, it's something that I'm sure is going to require some further look at in very near term. I bet you there's some folks in the room who'd love to talk to you about that. I'm sure. Jennifer, how about you? Um, I just um, switch gears a little bit, yeah. like away from data center, because that's sort of on the um, on the demand side. But if I think about AI in this sector, um, there's such an opportunity. We're so data rich, um, and we don't know what to do with that data. Mm. And all of a sudden, AI gives us the opportunity to start to leverage that data. Um, by no means is this going to replace people, but it's going to change the way we work. Um, and so you think of it almost like as an assistant, and all of a sudden we have answers faster, um, and we have answers that are pulling in from more data sets than we ever could could imagine. Um, and with that, like the opportunity is, as we just talked about the labor shortage, yep. and all of a sudden if you can start to do work far more efficiently, you can do these projects with fewer people. Yeah. And I don't mean less people than we have now. I mean yeah. that the challenge in the future to build out becomes smaller. Yeah, yeah. Indrani. I would say that, um, and I was going to go with the same uh, bent in terms of how you use or can leverage AI. Um, for years we have, and if you cringe or think I'm out to lunch, uh, trust me when I say so much of the work in this sector still happens on spreadsheets. It is cringeworthy. But the ability to churn through data and now liberate people to use their brains to work smarter, not necessarily harder. And it's not that, it doesn't have to be that trade-off, but it also, again, if I take you back to marketing, it creates an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit of, hey, now I have all of this information. What does that tell me about my customers? What does that tell me about my sighting? What does that tell me about the next data center that's going to come in? It's an opportunity for us to get ahead of what's coming at us. Generally, as a sector, we have been highly reactive because we haven't had the tools and we haven't, been, we haven't had the ability to grind through the data. We actually haven't had access to the data. Then we had the data, but we didn't have the um, 
the uh, capability to grind through the data. Now we have the data, tools that we can use to leverage the data that give us insights that then allow us to be proactive, which when you're going through this massive transition, anything that you can do to get ahead will likely serve us better for the future. Yeah. Shelly. It's hard, <laughs> it's hard to be last. Um, so we'll I, go first next time. <laughs> OK, great. Um, but I guess maybe what I'll say is I think in a lot of ways we're already using AI. Um, and so we think of it as this big sort of panacea that's going to solve a lot of, of problems, that's going to alleviate a lot of pinch points. I think in a lot of ways, as organizations, and certainly at Atura, and I know at OPG, it's already built into a lot of the way that we get things done. And so it's about how do we refine the way that we're using it to really maximize it? Um, how do we demystify it a little bit for our staff? How do we make sure that our employees don't feel afraid that this means that they aren't going to have a job? Um, and, and really just sort of continue to integrate it into the way that we get things done. And final question, as we go through the great transition and we depend upon the grid far more for everything, we have to recognize that all four of you operate critical infrastructure in this country, serious critical infrastructure. And you also have to recognize that geopolitically, we're in a different world these days, and oftentimes you have a lot of outside actors who would love to be able to come in and disrupt our critical infrastructure. So. How are you all thinking about that side of resilience and security when it comes to the operations? And I am going to start with you, Shelley. OK, sure. Great. <laughs> I know. Tough one last. I know. <laughs> God love you. You got the easy question. Yeah, exactly. No problem. Yeah. I mean, for sure, we operate critical assets. No question. Um, there are absolutely are critical things that we need to be thinking about and that we are required to be thinking about from a regulatory perspective to protect our assets. Um, from cyber threats, from other types of attacks, um, and, and those things are, are real and we need to be constantly moder monitoring what's happening out in, not just what's happening in the sector or what's happening within Canada, but what's happening all around the world. And, you know, OPG in particular has a very sophisticated um, CIO team, cyber team that is managing these things. And as a subsidiary, we get to benefit um, from all of that, that important information that helps us make decisions about, you know, how do we want to make sure that, um, and, and we test these things too, right? So how do you make sure that you've got the right systems in place, that your people understand the importance, that if there is an incident, that you know how to respond. Um, so we don't take any of that for granted, absolutely. We understand the critical nature of our role. What's the question again? <laughs> you operate critical infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> you are in a different geopolitical world right yeah. now, and you are probably more subs susceptible to incoming um, attempts of mischief. We'll put it that way to be nice. You know, it's it's interesting because we uh, we certainly invest heavily in cyber uh, security, cyber training. Um, there is no end, like it's a bottomless pit in terms of how much you could invest. Mm -hmm. And you'd likely never as a CEO feel like you've done enough. Um, what we're balancing though, is that there are the outside threats as well as the inside threats. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, there are nefarious actors, absolutely. And when I look at our, uh, our, our IT statistics of number of emails in, number that are legitimate, like it is staggering that it is three or four times the, the illegitimate emails versus ones that are actually real. But the greatest, the greatest threat, frankly, are our own employees. So we, are, we double down on education between phishing and now, have you heard of quishing? So the QR code is now the, the latest attempt on phish, so phishing but with a Q. I didn't come up with the word. Anyway, quishing, so we're teaching our, our staff so that when they see it, they think twice that we are teaching our younger staff to pick up the phone and make a phone call to double check. Uh, it's sort of basic stuff, but it is so much about managing the humans because the nefarious actors, like you, you can put up as many firewalls, you can pen test all you want. If, if they want to get in, ultimately, it's not a matter of uh, whether or not they will. It's just a matter of when. Mm -hmm. But the piece that is far more manageable are the humans internal to your organization and education, testing, um, and uh, uh, constantly <coughs> doubling down on uh, the messaging is critical. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just add that, um, you know, the electricity sector has been um, 
very good from a resiliency perspective. If you go back 20 years where we lost grid power in North America, um, it was the um, it was the, actually the Bruce units that were able to stay at power and and uh, black start the rest of the system. Um, and so we sort of take for granted that we have a fairly resilient system, but. Um, we talked about cyber, we talked about climate change. Uh, Lisa and I were talking about, now we hear about tornadoes every single week in Ontario and tornadoes taking out a large transmission system is, is, a, real, is a real possibility. So resili resiliency um, is a team sport. And so when we have to look at uh, critical infrastructure, we have to look at everything from distribution all the way to, to generation because the expectation of the population is that when you turn the lights on, they turn on. Yeah. So it's it, it's a big big focus, uh, not just um, within within our, our our generating assets, but across the across the electricity sector. For you to wrap it up, or you can answer a different question if no, you like. I, I, well, I, I'm prone to doing that. I'll just, I'm probably the last person in the world that should make any comments on cybersecurity. I mean, obviously, operating nuclear assets, operating electricity fleet, um, really really important. Uh, the only thing that really resonates with me on this is we've now adopted, I don't know, is it like a 20 digit sort of passcode to get into our emails every, like to get your thing, like I can barely remember what that is, but that is how, you know, it's, it's the phrase but then with a number, with an exclamation mark, and that's every single time because we're having to get smarter and smarter and figure our ways around this because you're right, and Ronnie, like it's, it's, the people are cracking this, it's getting through, it's going to keep coming. And on the fishing front, I mean, at a, on a practically a weekly basis, we discuss this, um, you know, and, 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 you know, okay, who, who failed fishing this week? And all you do is you hope it's not your group because then you're just basically, you're getting ridiculed and you're like, I don't know what to do here. And but so, it's a serious matter. So yeah. in the great transition that we talked about today, how prepared, how optimistic are you individually as to how well we're going to do in Ontario? Shelley, going to start with you. And it doesn't have to be a long answer. Yeah. Are you optimistic? No, totally optimistic. Okay. We can do it. Indrani. Love it, and I'm glad the Empire Club had, had us talking about it. It's okay. wonderful. Perfect. Jennifer. Yeah, echo that. I think the opportunity is enormous. And Heather. Entirely optimistic. Excellent. And excited. Five optimists up here on the panel. So congratulations for that. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Over to you, Sal. Jennifer and Heather and uh, thanks again to all our sponsors for their support and everyone joining us today in person or online. As a club of record, all Empire Club of Canada events are available to watch and listen to on demand on our website. The recording of this event will be available shortly and everyone registered will receive an email with the link. Tomorrow, Thursday, June 13th, join us for Building Ontario, the province's manufacturing renaissance with the Honourable Vic Fidelli, the Minister of Economic Development job creation and trade for the Government of Ontario, where he'll share his insights into how the province has been supporting the revival of Ontario's auto manufacturing sector. Save the date for September 18th, where we will welcome Eric Chassard as the incoming President and CEO of Bruce Power. Thank you for your participation and support. Have a good afternoon. This meeting is now adjourned.